Beloved by God Church, let us begin our service before the Lord. Let us stand up and confirm the confessions of the faith of our heart, the promise that belongs to the door of our hope. May the resurrection of Christ rule within our bodies. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for the great privilege of being in this place that your hand has appointed for the worshiping of your holy name. Now allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted up to heights that are not reachable for us and destroy all burden and sin that binds us. May in this service, as previously, all the works of devil be cursed, illnesses, poverty, untimely death, demonic possession, all matter of fear, depression, destruction, ignorance, error, all of this, may it depart from the tents of your holy people. Now stand, O Lord, upon the place of your rest, you and the ark of your might, and may your saints be clothed into your salvation and rejoice before your face. Give us more of your Spirit. Saturate us with your Holy Spirit. Allow us to find your great face. We thank you that the service is presented by Apostle Arkady into your godly hands, and we pray continue to lead it with a mighty and powerful arm, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May you be blessed. Please be seated. The Book of Apostle Paul, Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful lusts, to be made new by the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self, created by God in true righteousness and holiness. And so the theme that had been given to us by our pastor is the right to the power to put off our former way of life so we can clothe our bodies into a new way of life. To fulfill this decree and commandment written in the book of Apostle Paul and presented to us in the series of sermons of Apostle Arkady, we need to put three destiny impacting, commanding, and fundamental acts into practice. These are put off, be renewed, and put on. Fulfilling these three requirements will determine whether our salvation happens that is given to us as a guarantee in the format of a seed, which we need to obtain as a possession in the format of the fruit of righteousness. I've noted for myself this word. When we achieve our salvation, we know that with fear and trembling, we need to accomplish it, we need to achieve it. And so, how often is it preached today accurately how you need to obtain your salvation? Did Jesus upon the Golgotha say, he said, it is finished. And by saying this, he told us he did his part, but collaborating with a holy person, God has done his part, now man needs to do his part. In Revelations, in the last chapters, it says, and the one seated on the throne has said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, first and the last. The one who overcomes will inherit with me. This is the second time that the one upon the Golgotha had said it was finished. He said it again, it was finished, and the one that will overcome will inherit. And one of the seven angels came up to John and told him, Come, I will show you the victor, the victorious one. This is the Jerusalem, the bride of the Lamb. And so these are people who uh, will achieve their salvation. And so we need to understand again that God has done his part upon Golgotha and now we need to do our part so that God would be able to say about us, it is finished. The one who overcomes will inherit with me and I will be a God to you and you will be my son. And that between the two uh, times that this has been stated, that it is finished, there was one more time this was said, and this was when Babylon was destroyed. 
And so we need to understand that if he will not be destroyed, then there will not be any possibility of the heavenly Jerusalem in us. Relevant to this, we stop to study the allegory contained in the 18th Psalm of David, where knowing confessing, knowing and confessing the power that is contained in the heart of David consisted of the eight names of God allowed David to love and call upon the Lord who is worthy of praise, and gave God the legitimate ability to use the power contained in the capabilities of his names in battle against the enemies of David, Psalm 18, 1 through 3. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. And so, here in this place of scripture, Pastor has noted eight names of God, and let us proclaim them. Lord, you are my strength. Lord, you are my rock. Lord, you are my fortress. Lord, you are my deliverer. Lord, you are my rock in whom I take refuge. Lord, you are my shield. Lord, you are the horn of my salvation. Lord, you are my stronghold. The Lord has made us worthy of his names. And as he has honored us with these wonderful revelations, we will continue to study our inherited lot in Jesus Christ, studying the name of God Rock as our Rock of Israel, studying this fifth name within the list of God's names. And it was necessary for us to answer a series of questions, what characteristics and categories identify our inherited lot contained in the name of God, Rock of Israel, what purpose in the realization of our salvation is our inherited lot called to fulfill, what price do we need to pay or are we required to pay to provide God with the ability to be our Rock of Israel, and the results that will help us determine that God is truly our Rock of Israel as it relates to the realization of our calling. And we have been studying the third question. The, the third question is the price that is required to be paid to provide God with the legitimate ability to be our rock of Israel. How much does this cost? And the Lord tells us and what price is required so that God can be our rock of Israel. So that in this oath name we would be able to receive and open for us these oath promises, all of the oath promises God has, they're concealed in his oath names. And as we had seen very clearly that confessing the power that is contained in the name of God, David confessed this power, allowed God to utilize the power that is in his names against the enemies of David. And so what is the price that is required? And we looked at three prices and today we'll look at the fourth. And it will likely take up a couple of sermons because that is how long it took our pastor to go uh, to uh, look at it. And so the fourth component of the price called to give God the legitimate ability to be our rock consists in our decision to listen to God and walk in His ways. Not just walk in any ways, but first you need to listen to Him and then walk in His ways. And so the price is to listen to God and to walk in His ways. Psalm 81, 13 through 16. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to Him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock, I would have satisfied you. And so again, we see here the name Rock, Rock of Israel. In the given appeal of God addressed to his nation and fulfilling his will, presented in two mutually linked commands, that is to listen to God and to walk in his ways, we are presented with God's rewards consisting of six different components. 
there are two commands to listen to God and walk in His ways. And if we follow them, God gives us six rewards. We see here that God promises that He would soon subdue our enemies. Second, God would turn our hand against our adversaries. Third, the haters of the Lord will pretend submission to us. Fourth, our fate will endure forever. Fifth, God promises to feed us with the finest of wheat. And sixth, God has taken the responsibility to satisfy us with honey from the rock. <clears throat> and this is because we had the ability to listen to God and to walk in His ways. You receive these six rewards. Throughout all of Scripture, the fulfillment of the will of God contained in His commandments was always followed by the good reward of God, which the Scripture describe as the pure, imperishable, holy, and unsearchable inheritance of Christ, being kept for us in heaven, in the sanctuary, and in our contrite and humble heart, trembling before the preached word of God. What have we noted here? To fulfill God's will, God then blesses me with imperishable promises, not just those in heaven, but they will also be in the sanctuary in the church. And it also will be within my heart. It's not any good to me at the moment that it would just be in heaven, but it also is within the walls of this temple and also in my heart. And so I've noted this, that it's very interesting that when we fulfill God's commandments, God will honor us, He will show us His favor, everything that will be in heaven will also become the possession of the church and the possession of our heart. The command of God, which when fulfilled, is called to open to us the way into the lot of the pure, imperishable, and unsearchable inheritance of Christ contained in the name of God, Rock of Israel, addressed to us in two parts, listen to God and to walk in His ways. And so let's look at these uh, six separate blessings or rewards that God has prepared for the saints who will listen to God and walk in His ways. We'll look only look at two today, and in the next services, we will look at the next ones. The first component of our reward contained in the name of God, Rock of Israel, which upon the condition that we fulfill the two above-mentioned commandments to listen to God and to walk in His ways, has promised to soon subdue our enemies. This is the first promise to soon subdue our enemies. We ask the question, what kind of enemy is it referring to? And in what way will God subdue our enemies? Let's look at two forms of enemy. One is inside of us. The other is outside of us, but still nearby or next to us. First, the enemies of Israel were obviously the Gentiles or foreigners living amongst them upon the territory of the promised land, which from the beginning was called the land of Canaan, named after their patriarch Canaan, from whom they originated, and only after when Israel took hold of its inheritance, promised by God to their fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, did the Canaanite land begin to be called the land of Israel. And so, the Canaanite people living amongst us. Second, the enemies of Israel were the surrounding nations who directly bordered the land of Israel called Gentiles. In Hebrew, the word Gentile means uncircumcised, not having a covenant with God, idol worshippers, unclean or wicked, enemies of the truth. These are the Gentiles. And so if a person is an enemy of the truth, an enemy of the truth is one who hears the truth and does not accept it. This is one who is a Gentile. Although he may call himself a Christian, was baptized in water, and maybe even speaks in tongues. The scriptures call him a Gentile in this way. Considering that the land of Israel represents the body of a saved person, the Gentile nations living upon the territory of the land of Israel symbolize the unclean thoughts and corrupt desires living within our body in the form of the old man carrying the program or possessing the program of the fallen cherubim. 
the enemies living directly next to Israel, bordering the land of Israel, symbolize wicked and lawless men who are in the midst of the category of men who do fear God. It is the same as the weeds amongst the wheat, known as the category of the called, who until time, until the time of the harvest are upon the same field with the wheat. <clears throat> and so we see the, the first enemy are those living upon the territory of Canaan, our unclean thoughts, our corrupt desires, who represent the program of the old man. This is inside of us, and all that that borders us and is next to us are the unclean and lawless. These are the wheat that are, are upon the same field with the wheat, or the weeds uh, that are on the same field with the wheat until a specific time uh, that God is uh, appointed. And so a weed is typically a uh, seen pretty clearly or determined very clearly when at the time comes you begin to notice that certain people begin to group themselves into certain uh, in certain ways until this time they did not like each other did not unite but uh, you then see this is the time of testing or trials and so when uh, they they begin to bundle and they leave the church and if you see that you're not part of that or not doing those things in the, at that time then you obviously are not part of the category of the weeds the Lord has not finished his work but he will not continually only be binding these weeds and throwing them out there will be a time when this will uh, end as well Now that we have determined who our enemies are, we need to determine what the instruments and means are that God will use to subdue our enemies upon the condition that we follow His commandments presented in two parts. This is to listen to God and to walk in His ways. To subdue our enemies means to hold a complete and crushing victory over them, make them slaves, impose a tax on them, which upon practice or in practice means bind and abolish the authority of the old man within our body in his corrupt desires and lead your feelings with a bridle upon the path of God as a trained horse. This is what it means to humble our enemies, to subdue them. Uh, you lead your feelings with a bridle. You in this way subdue your enemies that are inside of you. You bind and abolish the authority of the old man and this is our ability to lead our feelings and emotions with a bridle and so you may somebody may ask well how do I determine that my old man is abolished God will thrust him out of our bodies but before this happens he needs to be the, his authority inside of you needs to be abolished he needs to be bound and he will be bound for a thousand years and then for a certain amount of time he'll be released again and then he'll be thrown into the lake of fire and the old man has the same destiny as his father the devil so to abolish that's abolish authority from him first and then he will be able to be destroyed the, the instruments that God will use to subdue our enemies, both within our body as well as out of our body, will be the members of our body committed as slaves to righteousness for holy work. And so every time we perform good work or holy work, these are instruments that subdue our enemies, the means that God will use to humble our enemies, both within our body as well as out of our body, will be our lips confessing the faith of God abiding within our heart. For if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9, 10. You need to, you need to utilize your lips so that you can subdue the enemy that is inside of us. If we subdue the enemy inside of us, then it will be very easy to subdue the enemies that are outside of us. 
because they will not come near to you come near to you they will avoid you they will try to avoid you in every way as he had spoken to uh, Gideon uh, you will destroy as in the old if you destroy your old man then you'll be able to destroy as, as if you destroyed all the rest of the nations this is the first blessing that God will subdue our enemies and we've determined who our enemies are they are inside of us in our thoughts in our desires and outside of us these are the wicked and lawless people these are weeds carnal people and it's not necessary to be looking for them you just need to look inside at the one enemy that's in you where you whom you need to work with or whom you need to abolish uh, abolish the old the power of the old man and we do this by our ability to lead our emotions and feelings with our with a bridle this was the interesting first component the second component of our reward which is a little bit more broad and will and will take a little bit more time the second component of our reward contained in the name of God rock of Israel which upon the condition that we will fulfill the two above mentioned commandments to listen to God and to walk in his ways has promised to turn our hand against our adversaries to turn our hand against our adversaries Exodus 15:19 For the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and his horsemen into the sea and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them but the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea the Lord turns his hand against our adversaries and he did this by re- bringing back the waters and drowning all of the army of Egypt and the Lord covers entire nations in this way the sons of Israel represent the sacred man at the same time the Egyptians oppressing us symbolize our souls expressing themselves in worldly wisdom when the sons of Israel sanctified themselves and their houses and performed the Passover of the Lord God received the legitimate ability to turn his hands against the oppressing them Egyptians and drown them in the deep waters in this way the Lord turns his hand against our oppressors our adversaries and these adversaries are inside of us this is human wisdom all of that Egypt and we speak of wisdom that is in the eyes of men maybe wisdom but in God's eyes is foolishness and God frees us from this uh, carnal state and this type of wisdom the next example of how God will turn his hand against our adversaries if we will fulfill, if we will fulfill his will we will find in the reproach against David by Abigail's husband Nabal and how this happens first Samuel 25 38 through 42 then it happened after about 10 days that the Lord struck Nabal and he died so when David heard that Nabal has was dead he said blessed be the Lord who had pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and kept and has kept a servant from evil for the Lord had returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head the Lord turns his hand against our adversaries he took the evil of Nabal and put it upon him he returned it and David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife when the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel they spoke to her saying David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife then she arose bowed her face to the earth and said here is your maidservant a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord so Abigail rose in haste and rode on a donkey attended by five of her maidens and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife 1 Samuel 25, 38 through 42. So she had five servants, five maid servants that accompanied her. She abolished the old man, Nabal. And how do we determine this? Look how wonderfully everything is shown here. And so 
we abolish again the power of our old man by our ability to discipline our feelings, our emotions with our bridle, any negative emotions as well. And these five servants were her maid servants. They, she completely disciplined this area of her self, her emotions, her feelings. And this was when Nabal was already destroyed. Let's look at all of these people. David symbolizes the sacred person in the form of our born from God's spirit. Abigail symbolizes our soul, being under the power or control of Nabal, representing governing sin living within our earthly body in the form of the old man. David, desiring to receive food from his soul because he protected her flocks, <clears throat> protected her flocks in the form of her good thoughts, received rejection from the old man being the husband of the soul. David wanted food because he protected the flocks of Nabal. And what, what flocks? The good, godly thoughts. Because when we sit in the church and we listen to revelations of God, these are godly thoughts. These are the flocks. And these specific flocks, David was protecting. There were a lot of... Uh, uh, there were a lot of people that were not good in the area and he protected them and see what Nabal uh, had said he said uh, why should why should I bless you he asks David what, what why should I give you anything this is what the soul uh, the old man was saying to the spirit this is how he behaved with David and David was surprised he was rejected by the old man who was the husband of the soul, the husband of Abigail. And then David swore that he will destroy everything living with Nabal. Uh, Abigail, hearing about this, immediately st uh, stocked all of the food David needed upon the donkey and went to David. And what was the food? What did David want? He sa David said, I am protecting the godly thoughts uh, that you hear in the church can you give me bread confess the faith of your heart I will not well if you do confess these good thoughts that you have obtained in the church that you need to confess while they are just in the mind we are masters of them but as soon as we release it with our mouth we speak the word that is in our thoughts then it goes out of our mouth now they become our master and we need to then uh, follow that and so you can you you meditate but you need to confess it also but the old man doesn't want to confess the word he wants to be the master of the of the thoughts and words that are received and we see that Abigail agreed to confess the old man will not confess he will be silent because silence is I'm the master of these thoughts but Abigail said I will confess these good thoughts and she then stocked up her donkey and uh, brought everything that he needed for him and his servants. David accepted Abigail and canceled his verdict, allowing God to avenge him and punish Nabal. After 10 days, symbolizing the law of Moses, God struck Nabal and he died. Therefore, Abigail, in the form of our soul, died by the law for the law. And so these 10 days, God struck, after 10 days, he, God struck Nabal. She, by the law, died for the law to live in a new quality, in a new way for the one who died for her and resurrected. And in this way, gave God the legitimate ability to turn his hand against our adversaries. We see in what way we can collaborate with God so that we can strike our Nabal. And to be able to strike him, we need to... Uh, honor our David we need to proclaim the not existent as existent and count yourself dead to sin living for God these two to proclaim the not existent as existent in Jesus Christ and counting yourself dead to jealousy and living for God is what David said to Nabal I protect these thoughts can you confess the word of God and he said I will not I want to be the master and Abigail, as we see, she said, I will bless David 
and she with her maidservants she made uh, she used her will she began to proclaim the word of uh, the faith of her heart and as soon as she began to proclaim the faith of her heart nabal his heart became as a stone how can we abolish the power of nabal we need to work with god because no one will be able to uh, turn off the system after 10 days god destroyed nabal not abigail uh, abigail is not the one who killed uh, nabal god did it and sometimes people try to do different things to be able to somehow uh, eradicate him but you can't you have to work with god to do this David says, I'm protecting these thoughts that you're holding in your heart, renewing your heart, renewing your mind with the spirit of your mind. But why am I renewing? Why am I guarding these flocks? So that that teaching that is in your heart be in your mind, and from the mind, then it, it be proclaimed with the mouth. And Nabal refuses to proclaim the faith of, of the heart. I will be silent because I want to be master. Because as soon as I proclaim this, I become a servant of these words. And Abigail made, obviously, the right decision and began to proclaim the faith of her heart. And after 10 days, God destroyed Nabal. That's how we uh, That's how we abolish him. That's how we destroy him eventually. God will be able to destroy him. We need to confess the thoughts that we receive in our heart and renew our mind with. A very interesting uh, example story here we see how God stretches out his hand, hand against the enemies our enemies our adversaries the first was the e- Egypt the second was Nabal and and Nabal and Abigail both were part of the soul but the word of God shows here the two uh, in, that there was the soul and also the old man and while Nabal and Abigail were together, bound by the law, uh, David needed to have destroyed both. But as soon as the soul was lost in the in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, because she brought the gifts, the fruit of her mouth, she brought to David. Uh, at this time, this uh, bond, uh, this union with the old man is is broken. The, the old man refuses to confess the word of God. But the soul chose to use the will to confess the word of God. And so the soul then says, okay, I'm going to use your emotions and I'm the old man and I'm going to make you depressed. And she, instead, you take the word of God and proclaim it with your mouth. This was the second example. The next example of how God will turn his hand against our adversaries if we will fulfill his will, we will find in the collaboration of our cross with the cross of Christ. Collaborating our cross with the cross of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.18-20 through 20. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? In the given place of Scripture, the collaboration of our cross with the cross of Christ implies fulfilling the being studied by His commandments in their two parts, to listen to God and walk in His ways. And so how do we collaborate our cross with the cross of Christ? If you're asked after church, how do we collaborate our cross with the cross of Christ? Is it suffering? Yeah, suffering sometimes is is part of it, but we need to listen to God and walk in God's ways. Take up your cross and follow me to listen to God and walk in his ways. The wise and the scribes that is referring to these are the carnal people who fill churches and who persecute the true righteous because they collaborate their cross with the cross of Christ because they have the ability to listen to God and walk in his ways the reason that they themselves cannot receive 
what comes from the Spirit of God. And what comes from the Spirit of God? The ability to listen to God and to walk in His ways. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so there were the wise men and others, but there are those who have the mind of Christ. We can call ourselves those who fear God, who love God, but if we resist the truth contained in the collaboration of our cross with the cross of Christ, then we are haters of the truth and those saints who are in this truth. We will note again that the unique power of the blood of Christ, the power of the blood of Christ, separate from the cross of Christ, is not legitimate and cannot be activated by us. The power of the blood of Christ, separate from the cross of Christ, is not legitimate. This is a revolutionary truth. We need the power of the blood of Christ. Everything that is in the blood of Christ, it is in the tree of life. But to get to the tree of life, we need to pass through the 12 pearly gates, the 12 gates and uh, approach then this tree that produces its fruit. We need to utilize the cross of Christ, the 12 gates, so that we can have access to the 12 feasts. These are the fruits uh, producing its fruit each month. Because specifically, the truth about the cross of Christ is that exclusive option or ability that we have opening for us access to the treasure contained in the blood of Christ. The cross of Christ is the key to the door or to the pearly gate that leads to the inheritance that is contained in the blood of Christ presented to us in the tree of life. You would think, Lord, is it possible I don't receive all these treasures when I'm born again? You do. and But you, you have to take them. And the, the way you need to take them, and so for, for me to be able to obtain them, or uh, we need to have our foundation and then build up the walls, the 12 uh, walls, and then the 12 gates, the pearly gates, and then I will take what is given to him, to me in the blood of Christ. And so if this would have, if this would have been preached in some of these charismatic churches, for example, if someone came out and said, let me tell the truth, all the stuff that you have, all your success, money, cars, houses, uh, golden teeth if when they were popular. You were misinformed that to receive everything that is in the blood of Christ requires the cross of Christ. And let me show you the portrait of Christ on the cross. And so anyone who wants to receive Christ, we will wait for you here. And very few would probably come out. But when they're trying to tempt with food or other things, uh, then uh, people behave very differently. Specifically, the truth about the cross of Christ is that only way, the only path that will take you, will give you access then to the door of the blood of, of, of the blood of Christ. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross.
and I have noted this for myself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And so when I highlight for myself, I note also for myself, I then remember things better, uh, and this is one of the things that I note. We will not forget that the goal of the professional deceiver is to separate the truth of the blood of Christ from the truth of the cross of Christ so that he could present to man only that part of the truth that would uh, impress him or would be desirable to him, something he doesn't need to pay a price for. That is why the truth of the blood of Christ, separate from the cross of Christ, is so attractive and tempting because it is it is cut up and the role of man in fulfilling the truth of the or to achieve this blood of the uh, of the of the cross of Christ is unfortunately not something that is possible and so when you only have the goal of the cross of Christ separate from the cross of of the cross of Christ then unfortunately there's exploitation that takes place for for the benefit or interest of man the shedding of the blood of Christ first of all was called to satisfy the demands and desires of God, not man, because the blood of Christ was brought before God's face and not before man's face. The shedding of the blood of Christ needed to satisfy the requirements and desire of God. God has desires. He has demands and he has the requirements and desires. And this satisfied his demands, this satisfied his requirements and desire and only after man collaborating with God collaborating with God in the in the cross of Christ using the cross of Christ then uh, this blood of Christ would be able to satisfy the desire of man and so it's not possible to have the blood of Christ without the cross of Christ because we will be as pastor says uh, we will be trying to select things as as our pastor says on a menu uh, but we need all of the oath promises and not just show with our finger to God what we want and what we don't want and if the cross of Christ was the calling of Christ and his obligation carrying his cross he fulfilled the perfect will of the Father and this was great and noble goal and it redeemed us from sin and death for the sake of which God had sent him. And so the calling of, of Christ upon the cross were the great and noble goals of God to deliver us from sin and death for the sake of which he had sent him. At the same time, our cross is our calling, demonstrated in our obligations and our responsibilities. And to fulfill these obligations, collaborating our cross with the cross of Christ, it is necessary to fulfill the condition of rejecting yourself or denying yourself or denying everything. In other words, identifying our cross is presented in the commandments and instructions of God for us. Fulfilling and obeying these commandments is carrying our cross. And so again, defining the cross and carrying the cross. The cross are God's commandments and instructions and whether we carry this cross do we fulfill these commandments and instructions also uh, for Jesus he had a commandment from God carrying his cross and fulfilling God's commandments <clears throat> and carrying it is fulfilling again these commandments and instructions of the Lord and so we ask the question <clears throat> what is the truth about the blo- about the cross of Christ? What is the truth of the cross of Christ? And how is our cross different from the cross of Christ? The cross is a tool uh, to commit someone to death. And this was a form of punishment in the ancient world. And so the cross, apart from its direct meaning, has a very deep and symbolic also meaning And the symbolic meaning of the cross when it comes to man and Christ, uh, they're they're different. And so if the blood of the cross of Christ was called to destroy the sin we've committed, this was the the blood of Christ. The cross itself was called to 
eradicate or abolish the producer of the sin. That is our old, uh, our old nature. And so collaborating with the truth of the cross of Christ blots out the committed sin. At the same time, collaborating with the truth of the cross of Christ abolishes within our body the producer of the sin. The truth of the cross of Christ abolishes the producer of the sin when we we commit the effort to collaborate with the cross of the cross of Christ. And so again, we need to put forth our effort to be able to collaborate with the cross of Christ, to abolish within our body the producer of, of the sin. In the blood of Christ, God destroys the sin that we have committed. The truth of the cross of Christ, it abolishes within our body the producer of sin. To be able to be delivered, we need to apply the cross, and this requires great effort. Matthew 16, 24 through 27. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. And so Jesus had said, we need to take our cross and follow him. And so it turns out we have our own cross, Jesus has own has his own cross, and we together carry our crosses. Jesus goes ahead, and I follow him, so that I not say then that I am the one who suffered for the truth. Jesus said, "Take up your cross." You say, "Jesus, can I help you carry your cross?" No. You need to take up your own cross and follow after me. Don't go to the side. Follow me. We see that we could try to support and help Christ carry his. Uh, but Christ requires, the Lord requires that we carry our own cross. And then we can boast about how much we suffer for the truth. We need to follow after Christ to determine whether we are suffering for the truth. And so carrying our cross, that is fulfilling our calling, is directly linked to certain forms of suffering which form a person into the image of God. Not every form of suffering forms our character into the image of the character of Christ. Allow me to read this again. Not every form of suffering forms our character into the image of the character of Christ. Because the result of a committed by man's sin also has suffering and also produces death. But such suffering does not form a person into the character of Christ, but is the opposite. It transforms him into the image of sin. And so the phrase to follow me is to imitate me as I fulfilled the will of my Father, demonstrated in his commandments for me, consisting of me losing my life so that I can reobtain it. You do the same. Fulfill the commandments given to you, consisting of losing your life in my death so that you could reobtain it again in my resurrection. A very beautifully stated where Jesus says, follow me. This is what this means. Imitate me as I lost my life to reobtain it. You also need to lose your life so that you can reobtain it in my resurrection. A very unique phrase of follow me. The will of the Heavenly Father for His Son was that he lose his life upon the cross so that he can exchange destinies with us. He would take our sin and <clears throat> and punishment for sin and we, upon the same cross, would be able to have our righteousness. And so the truth about the cross of Christ has God's order and his holy theocracy. And so collaborating our cross with the cross of Christ, we will remember 12 
uh, components of our cross and the 12 components of the cross of Christ. Let us look at these 12 components. <coughs> First, the cross of Christ is the greatest commandment of the Father that is given to the Son, where for the Son this was the perfect will of the Father. John 10, 17, 18. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. An interesting commandment. You can give your life so that you can take it again, but in a new, already in a new way. And so the difference between our cross, that is our calling, from the cross of Christ in the form of His calling, is that Christ, to be able to purchase us from the kingdom of sin and death, voluntarily gave His life for us so that He can reobtain it. We, at the same time, to collaborate our cross with the cross of Christ, are called to voluntarily reject and lose our sinful life, which we have inherited from the sinful life of our fathers, so we can inherit the life of Christ that is given for us upon His cross. There's the difference. Christ gave His life so that we can give our sinful life inherited from our fathers so we can inherit eternal uh, eternal life in Jesus Christ and when we do this we behave this way that means we don't take up Christ's cross and try to help him we carry our own cross and follow him the collaboration of our cross with the cross of Christ first is to we need to take up our cross second we need to follow and imitate Christ and imitating Christ pastor says we need to not uh, play the role of Christ we have our own assignment what we need to be doing Christ gave his life and we give our sinful life he gave his holy life and was taking upon himself our old our our old nature we lose our old nature so that when Jesus was resurrected we together with Christ then can receive in his resurrection uh, life second the cross of Christ is his voluntary choice and his conscious decision to drink the cup completely that was intended for him by his father. Matthew 26, 42, again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. The difference between our cross and the cross of Christ, what does this say? That I've taken my cross, Christ has taken his, and I follow after Christ. And since I carry my cross, Jesus said, Remember, we have... A difference between our crosses. The second difference between our cross and the cross of Christ is that Christ, upon his cross, consciously and voluntarily separated from his Father. At the same time, we, in the cup that is given to us, collaborate our cross with the cross of Christ. We, uh, the, the opposite takes place. We obtain the lost. Uh, relationship with our Father. And so we reconcile with the Father. We reobtain our, our, our relationship with the Father at this time and become close to the Father. But you may say, well, I don't feel that. Just like in this case with Nabal, the emotions decided to stay with him and he decided not to uh, follow, but Abigail uh, in Abigail's case she also didn't feel it but God had performed the work of, of destroying Nabal in her life and so when you confess the word of God the old man says I don't want to but Abigail says I will we need to understand that we obtain fellowship with the father a relationship with the father and Jesus voluntarily separated from him Third, the cross of Christ is the experience of shame, mockery, humiliation, pain, suffering, rejection, torture, and death. Hebrews 12, 1, 2. 
let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, 1, 2. To endure the suffering is uh, looking at the one uh, who is the perfecter and finisher of our faith. The condition to collaborate again, our cross with the cross of Christ is the decision to uh, cast off all burden and sin that we're bound by. In this situation, the difference between our cross and the cross of Christ is that uh, Jesus upon the cross he experienced this mockery, humiliation, pain, death. We collaborating with the cross of Christ, carrying our own cross. We open for us the joy we will have in the Lord. Nehemiah 8.10 Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for for whom nothing is prepared for the day is the holy to our lord is holy to the lord do not sorrow for the joy of the lord is your strength and so here i've also noted that if i carry my cross but i don't have the joy of the lord that means that i am not carrying my cross it's a suffering that's actually producing uh, uh, first a spiritual death and then later a, a, an eternal death and so this is a joy, and it's not an earthly joy, and it's not an emotional joy. And this is uh, pretty much our, our broken spirit. In this case, around these people, there will be a fragrance, there will be a joy. And why? Because they carry the cross of Christ. And so again, Jesus carrying his cross, he, he mourned, he, he suffered. Uh, we up, obtain joy, and uh, as the opposite, uh, we obtain joy. Fourth, the cross of Christ is the voluntary suffering, and the result of it, his death for the sin of the chosen by God remnant. Isaiah 53, 6 through 8. Lord has... Uh, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. In the given situation, the difference between our cross and the cross of Christ was that Christ, upon his cross, su suffered for our sins. At the same time, we, collaborating our cross with the cross of Christ, suffer for the truth. The difference, Christ suffered for our sins, we suffer for the truth. First Peter 413 through 16. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Again, it says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. And you could say it like this, that because you, cro you collaborate your cross with the cross of Christ, rejoice that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of the glory of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as murderers, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. 1 Peter 4, 13-16 Apostle Peter says, that you not suffer like one who is an evildoer, a murderer, or a thief, because only suffering comes from this. This is not the cross of uh, the cross that we're carrying. When we suffer for the truth, then that means we're carrying our cross. Sometimes, when a person actually makes a mistake or, or commits some sort of sin and claims that he is uh, suffering for the sake of the truth. Fifth, the cross of Christ is the ability of Christ 
to demonstrate his obedience and his humility to the will of his heavenly Father. Philippians 2, 7, 8 But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. The difference between our cross and the cross of Christ is that Jesus upon his cross was obedient and was humble before the will of the Father because he took on the image of the bondservant and became as a man. He became as a man and took on the form of a bondservant. We, collaborating our cross with the cross of Christ, by being obedient and being humble before God's will, we lose uh, the state of a sinful uh, slave or servant and obtain the image of God. And so Jesus became as a, a servant, as a, as a man, but we, collaborating our cross with the cross of Christ, we took up our cross, we're following after him, directly after him, to Golgotha. That means we are losing our sinful, uh, uh, being as, as sinful slaves and obtain the image of God. Sixth, the cross of Christ is his absolute poverty and loss of all power and all authority. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. At the same time, we collaborating our cross with the cross of Christ, we open for us the ability to become rich because of the poverty of Christ, and this opens for us access to the innumerable and immeasurable uh, wealth of riches in God. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are per- perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so the question, with what do we become rich? With the poverty of Christ. Because specifically, in the poverty of Christ, God can give us the imperishable promises. He wants to give us wealth, but when it's talking about the poverty of Christ, he became, we became rich in his poverty. What, you want me to be poor and needy and live under a cross? Or, or under a, a bridge? Uh, no, this is uh, losing your soul in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. N- being under a bridge doesn't mean that you are suffering uh, and in the you are not in his poverty, the poverty of Christ. He became poor upon the cross, and he God has shown us what it means to have this poverty upon the cross. And because of this, we become <clears throat> rich in his poverty. The cross of Christ is a tool by which Christ has turned himself into an altar of the Lord, upon which he was sanctified as most holy, so that he can lead us to God. Ephesians five two. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. The cross in the form of an altar separated Christ from the world so that he belonged to God as an offering is a sweet-smelling sw- aroma. Exodus 40.10 You shall anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all its ut- utensils and consecrate the altar. The altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar must be holy. Carrying your cross... Carrying his cross, uh, Christ was sanctified and was the holiness. He was, a, he was the holiness of the Lord. So everything that touched him can be sanctified. And so we, the difference between our cross with, and the cross of Christ, uh, Christ, by the means of his sufferings upon the cross, was able to make himself the, the most holy to the Lord or the greatest holiness to the Lord due to which he received the ability to lead people to the Lord. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. At the same time, we, in the given situation, carrying our cross and collaborating with the cross of Christ, we actually come near to him and we by the means of our cross, receive the ability to sanctify ourselves. Judges 10, 15, 16. 
And the children of Israel said to the Lord, He we have sinned. To us what whatever seems best do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray, so that they put away the foreign gods from among them and serve the Lord. They did not turn to the Lord, and the Lord then did not turn to them. But as soon as they did, uh, when they sanctified themselves, they received access to God's grace, due to which their suffering obtained a new status, which activated God's mercy. And so the Lord was, uh, Jesus was sanctified, became an altar, and we, in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come in contact with this altar by sanctification. The Lord activates for us His mercy. He became an altar and we sanctify, we become this offering. Upon Golgotha, he wasn't just an offering, he was also the altar. And for whom was this altar? This was this altar was prepared for us. He was not just an offering, but he was an altar and the altar was for us. We will be that offering. He was sanctified for our sake so that we can sanctify ourselves and we become an all offering then upon this altar who is Christ. Eighth, the cross of Christ is the true drink and the true food or the true bread that satisfies the hunger and thirst of God. <clears throat> Leviticus 3, 6 and 11, if his offering is as a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord is of the flock, whether male or female, he shall offer it without blemish, and the priest shall burn them on the altar as food, an offering made by fire to the Lord. The difference between our cross and the cross of Christ. Christ, by the means of his cross, became the food and drink of his Father, due to which he satisfied the hunger and thirst of his Father. At the same time, we, in the given situation, satisfy our, or quench our, hung, our spiritual hunger and thirst, for the right and our hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God John 6 53 then Jesus said to them most assuredly I say to you unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood you have no life in you the Lord satisfies our hunger and thirst ninth the cross of Christ is a demonstration of the labor and greatness of the soul which brings him satisfaction Isaiah 53.11 He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. According to this place of scripture, the difference between our cross and the cross of Christ in the given situation consists in Christ, his cross <clears throat> is uh, and for Christ. So the cross allowed him to or gave him the ability to to perform this act of his soul and we in our situation we we become uh, we overcome we could say the nature of the our old nature and are victorious over it in our situation when we carry our cross and so we when we're born with our egoism we in this way eradicate our old man and we don't give him any satisfaction Tenth, the cross of Christ is the means by which Christ was able to know his Father. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Isaiah 53, 11. According to this place of scripture the difference between our cross and the cross of Christ for Christ his cross was the means by which he as a person was able to know the perfect love and wisdom of his father at the same time we in the given situation collaborating our cross with the cross of Christ we know the concealed uh, characteristics of wickedness in ourselves and so we then have the ability to reject these, uh, this wickedness so that we can be justified then in God. So we can receive righteousness by the faith of Jesus Christ. Jesus, 
was able to know one thing upon the cross and we a different thing what was concealed in our <clears throat> evil characteristics what kind of evil characteristics are concealed and so a person who carries his cross is a person who's able to see what's inside of him that's why apostle paul says uh, unfortunate man am i who will deliver me from this body of sin and so you say you may ask well this apostle how could he say these kinds of things And so we see that collaborating our cross is the means we use by which we can see the evil uh, uh, of the sinful conduct passed on to in, in its characteristics. And we leave all this in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Eleventh, the cross of Christ is the only way that God abolishes the enmity and reconciles in himself Israel and other Gentile nations, making them one nation in Christ. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. In the given situation, the difference between our cross and the cross of Christ is that Christ, carrying his cross, was able to abolish the enmity between Israel and the Gentiles with his teaching and has made, reconciled in himself one man, making him one man. We, in the given situation, collaborating our cross with the cross of Christ, we actually are a stumbling block amongst the carnal people, both from Jews and, the Jews and Gentiles, and actually, unfortunately, are reproached by them and oppressed by them. Galatians 5.11 And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. And so his brothers, even, uh, of their people, they also are persecuting, uh, and he was suffering because of them. And so when people say we need a, lo- a tolerant love, people want to take God's place. Christ upon the cross made reconciled the, the two, made two into one. We have a different role, the other side of the coin. And so I f- follow after Christ carrying my cross. And you need to, in your situation, make from one two. That means I'm going to lose my relatives, I'm going to lose my friends. Christ says, follow me. I make one from two, you make from one two. You'll be the other side of the coin. Christ can't can't achieve without us, and we without him can't either. Twelfth, the cross of Christ is expression and demonstration of the love of Christ, not for the whole world, as the ignorant try to convince us uh, people uh, in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, it's written, Husbands, love your wives, just why just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or or wrinkle or any such thing the difference between our cross and the cross of Christ is that Christ in carrying his cross demonstrated his selective love for his church at the same time we carrying our cross are called to demonstrate our belonging and our responsive love to God in the fruits of righteousness the Lord upon the cross demonstrated his love to us, and we upon our cross demonstrate our love to God. <clears throat> These are the unique uh, components and differences. And so we, we've looked at what the cross of Christ is. And so first we need to, again, take up our cross. Christ takes up his cross, we take up our cross. Okay, we've taken our cross. Second, we don't need to just go wherever. We need to follow after Christ. And so by following him, and I imitate him. But there's a big difference between what Christ was doing and what we're doing. Let us pray and thank God for the revelations that we're able to receive today. May you be blessed in your prayers.
Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are thankful to you <clears throat> for the great privilege of being in this place that your hand has appointed for the worshiping of your holy name. We thank you, Lord, that upon this place is your remembrance, because upon this place are your laws, your commandments, your statutes, and your instructions. We thank you, Lord, that upon the place will you place a, re <clears throat> a remembrance for your name. And this is the place where your word is, your Holy Spirit is. These two forms of wisdom without which we will be able to, we, we will not be able to keep you or grow and form into your godly image. We thank you that in the service where we are upon this place, you have blessed us with these two forms of wisdom and that we know upon this place is your fear and the atmosphere that is in this house. You said every one of us need to build ourselves into a temple of, of God <clears throat> and allow the atmosphere that's in this house of yours to be able to put this in our heart as well, in our mind, so that you, so we may revere before your word and the Holy Spirit that has become a Lord and Master for us, that it abide in the temple of every one of us, the temple of our body. We thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us today to collaborate with your godly names where you have revealed your oath promises to us. We thank you, Lord, that you, in the name, in your name as strength, have revealed yourself in your, in being unchanging in your word. <clears throat> when we have magnified you and magnified your word above all your name, the word before you yourself uh, ha obey and bow down to you <clears throat> are, are you treat your word just as we need to treat your word and we worship before your word today we thank you Lord that we can listen to you and we can walk in your ways we can't walk in your ways without first having the ability to listen to you but we come to this place where there's a remembrance for your name so that we can listen to what you say we can receive these words and we can immediately fulfill them walking in your godly ways and you have promised in your word that if we will hear your words and walk in your ways that you will quickly subdue our enemies you will turn your hand against all of our adversaries and we thank you that you give us absolute victory over our enemies over our enemies that are inside of us in these Canaanite nations and this Canaanite land will become the Israelite land that the promises that you've given to Abraham Isaac and Jacob and that you have given to the promised land it was the Canaanite land that was filled with enemies but you we prayed that you demonstrate your might and your power so that you can turn your hand against our adversaries we will not be able to take hold of the promised land without you we need your godly hand we need for you to strike our Nabal because without you we can't do anything and today we thank you that today we can tend your flocks your thoughts your mentality we can have the mind of Christ in our spirit and we thank you that we have the ability to renew our mind with the spirit of our mind so that by confessing with our mouth the faith of our heart <clears throat> the old man understands that by confessing with our mouth we will be able to be clothed clothed into our new person that's why he forbids uh, the the gifts to be brought to David but we make the voluntary decision today when Nabal still has the emotions and feelings Lord our soul today divorces from our Nabal and makes the decision to take only the will 
and the de and decision to confess the faith of our heart and to honor David, honor Christ in our sacred heart. Honor you in the revelations which you have given to us. And we thank you that today your words and your truth becomes our master and we confess today that we've made the decision to listen to your word and to walk in your ways. We pray, Lord, that these revelations not be our servants, but that this command become our master and we clothe ourselves into these confessions today, making your words by confessing them our master and in this way we magnify your word above all your names. If we will be silent and just think about them, we will never be able to, in the temple of our body to magnify your word. But, Lord, when we're taught by our pastor, we confess the word that is concealed in our heart and with which we have renewed our mind. We lift your word above all your name. We magnify your word and your word and your commandments become our masters and the Holy Spirit become a uh, changes from our guest to our master. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to teach us today and we can remember the importance of ter taking up our cross and following you. And we thank you that upon the cross you gave your holy life. Upon the cross we make the decision to lose our sinful life inherited from our fathers lose our character and this way we demonstrate that we carry our cross and follow you we thank you Lord that upon the cross you had separated from the Father but we when we carry our cross and we follow you we are filled with an unearthly joy not a blemished joy and we thank you for that we thank you that you experience shame mockery death upon the cross for our sin you suffered for our sin but Lord we today make the decision to suffer for your truth you have taken the form of a servant being the master being the Lord being the Son of God upon the cross and we thank you that we were taught that we, upon our cross, can lose the image of the slave of sin and receive the righteousness of God. We thank you, Lord, that upon the cross you became the possessor of absolute poverty. And we make the decision today, carrying our cross, and following you, following Christ, we become rich, rich in your poverty, by which you will be able to open to us and give to us imperishable wealth of heaven. We thank you, Lord, that the poverty of Christ gives us imperishable, pure, undefiled riches and promises that are kept in heaven for us. We thank you, Lord, that these promises are spoken in the service, that these promises are spoken by our lips and are in our heart, and we've received them. We thank you, Lord, that you have become a holiness, a great holiness, and the altar, and we become the offering upon this altar. You became food and drink for the Father, and we, carrying our cross, we eat this food and become one with you in your inheritance. We thank you, Lord, that upon the cross you had made from two one. You reconciled the two. You said, I had come to bring the sword and to separate. And so allow us to take up our cross and follow you and to make sure the sanctification happens and separation happens separate ourselves from everything that is hateful to you 
that is not acceptable to you, all that will be destroyed with your devouring an eternal fire. Allow us today, by carrying our cross, to condemn all of this. We thank you, Lord, for this revelation that we were able to remember today that was placed by our pastor upon the table of showbreads, the golden table of showbreads upon our heart, in our heart. Thank you for these wonderful, beautiful and correct revelations that have become not just the possession of our heart, but the possession of our mind and the possession of our lips as well, the confession of our lips. We can be clothed into your revelations. <clears throat> thank you for your church where your wisdom is. And we thank you for the person by whom you have revealed to us this wonderful truth, these revelations. And we pray, Lord, for him. As his word spoken by his mouth has comforted us, healed us, resurrected us, lifted us up, we pray, Lord, that today this very word spoken by our mouth would be able to serve him as his words he spoke served us. We pray, Lord, that this man be absolutely be restored before your face and all the revelations, all that beauty and all that wisdom that is written in your book, that it be revealed, that it be, the seals be broken, be revealed, Lord, the truth you've entrusted him with, even from his early days, <clears throat> to be able to bring to us these wonderful and correct revelations. We demonstrate our love to you by acknowledging and receiving the people that you have sent into our life. We demonstrate our love to your messengers, to your church, to your children. And by doing this, we show you how we will be with you in heaven. We value everything that you are in your word, in your Holy Spirit, in your death and your resurrection. We value all of this and we thank you, our great God, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us finish with our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen.